Hi, I just want to say I've been in Malmo now for a few days and I've had a fantastic time so far. What an incredible city you have here. Um, <laughs> okay, so I've led quite an improbable and unpredictable life. It's taken me to Sao Paulo in Brazil, where I've lived with 60 other people in a house to learn about the revolutionary music organization Foro do Oatio. It's taken me to the streets of Cairo, to Tahrir Square, during the recent revolutionary protests where tear gas was deployed onto the crowds. Next year, it will take me to sub-Antarctica, where I'll live on a boat with a bunch of scientists and artists. And through these experiences, I've been able to work with and witness some of the most incredible cultural activists across the world. Often those working in the most difficult of contexts, that of war, revolution, or communities at conflict. Today, I want to talk about the power of collectives, the incredible things that can happen when people work together, and about how resources, or lack of resources, don't necessarily matter when you have a passion in people to make things happen. Everybody has skills, skills can be shared, and ideas can be mobilized, now easier than ever with the internet and the connectivity it offers. Through my work, I've been able to develop an international perspective of what's possible when people work together. And I believe, and maybe quite controversially, that it's not about the fight, it's about making your own alternative. So, today I'm going to tell you my story, starting from when I was 10 years old, because I think this illustrates really well the idea of do it together. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about a few people that I met along the way that I think are really inspirational. Okay, so, when I was 10 years old, my life changed forever. <clears throat> um, this, uh, something happened that changed everything from there on in. And that's the reason I'm speaking here today, and that's the reason I've got to do lots of incredible things with my life. My parents bought me an electric guitar. And so from the age of 10, I started to learn to play the guitar. And then I decided that I wanted to form a band. So I asked my sister to learn drums and my best friend Lizzie to, to learn bass. And as soon as I started to work with these two other people, writing and recording music, more, more opportunities began to emerge and more incredible things began to happen. So first of all, we started playing gigs all around the country for the next 10 years and from the age of 12 years old. We were playing in bars and venues and so on. At this point, we're, we're located in Manchester. Manchester is in the north of the UK. And the music industry was located in the south, in London. So, as a band, we were forever having to go from Manchester to London to play gigs in front of rooms of very sceptical, very cool, very drunk A&R people, with, a, with looking at us and deciding whether or not we would get signed to their record labels. And after a while of doing this, after a good few years of doing this, we kind of got really disillusioned with the music industry as it was. And we decided that we wanted to kind of disrupt this. We wanted to make our own alternative. But we weren't the only people who felt like this. Along with a bunch of other bands from Manchester and the north of England, we decided to create our own platform for music from the north. We created a record label called Fat Northerner Records. And as soon as we started to work together, as soon as we brought all of these bands together, again, incredible things started to happen. So we were able to access public money from the Arts Council to release our music. We were able to tour the bands around the world, taking them to as far as Austin, Texas, to play incredible showcases. And we were able to release music from 60 bands and artists from the north of England. So just in this act of working together, we were able to transform our own opportunities. Now, at this moment, the music industry was going through a massive transformation. As you all probably know, digital technology was impacting upon the way music was being produced, consumed, and would be sustained. Every facet of the music industry was changing. There were new gatekeepers, new ways to discover music. There were new ways to share your music. No longer did you have to produce thousands of physical products. And there were new ways to connect with your audiences, new ways to talk to your fans. And for the first time, as musicians, you owned that relationship. Now, at this moment, the major recording industry was talking about how terrible this was for music. They were saying, this is the death of the music industry. 
And of course, we were running our small record label, and we were feeling very differently about this as were a collective of other record labels based in the north of England. And we wanted, we're having very different conversations. So what we decided to do is create a platform for discussion about the future of music as we were having. We created the platform of unconvention. And when I say a platform, I mean we booked a church in a place called Salford, and we invited a bunch of improbable people who were involved in the music infrastructure, but people who'd probably never attended a music industry event before. And unconvention was born. The event was tremendously successful. We set up a manifesto that explains what unconvention is. And these are some of the things from it. Unconvention is not about the music industry. Unconvention is not about the business of music. Unconvention understands the most interesting stuff happens on the margins. We don't mind the mainstream, we just don't find it relevant. And unconvention by its nature is, of course, unconventional. Essentially, unconvention is about strengthening, empowering, and giving voice to the grassroots music infrastructure through education, events, and initiatives. It's to help people understand the world that they're working in and make a sustainable living from music. So, we did this event in this church in Salford, and a bunch of people came, and a lot of people said it was the future of the music infrastructure. But then some incredible things happened. So, people started to get in touch with us who'd attended the event, and they wanted to take it to their cities around the UK. So we worked with people to take this idea, this platform, and this ethos to places like Brighton, Belfast, Swansea, and so on. Very quickly, we delivered lots and lots of events around the UK. But then something truly remarkable happened. People started to get in touch with us from very far away places around the world. They'd heard about this idea and way of thinking online, and they wanted to work with us to take this idea to places like India, places like Brazil, Argentina, Nepal, and so on. So we started to work with more and more people to take this idea to many different places. As we did this, we realized that Unconvention in Nepal couldn't talk about the same things that we talk about in the UK. So the idea of Unconvention began to evolve with the more people that we involved in the process. Unconvention in India, for example, was about an explosion of metal, rock, and electronic music, and it was about building an infrastructure to support that music. In Colombia, Unconvention was about music as a tool for social change, looking at how hip-hop is used in the poorest communities to transform those communities. Okay, so we've done 55 events now in 22 different countries in the past four years, over five continents. We've done Unconvention in many different languages and in many different cultural contexts, often taking it to some of the most perceived dangerous parts of the world. We've done all of this on really next to no resources. We've never had any core funding, and that, for me, is testament to the people involved in Unconvention and their passion and drive to transform opportunities for people at the grassroots. So, the latest development with Unconvention is that we've joined forces with 30 other countries, 30 other grassroots music networks around the world, to form something called the Global Music Network. And the ambitions of the Global Music Network are three. The first one is about the mobility of ideas. I'm forever going around the world and seeing really incredible things. We want to share those ideas with people that might not have the opportunities to travel. The second ambition is around the mobility of artists, taking artists from Nepal and have, getting them to play in Brazil, and so on. And the third ambition is to create and disseminate free digital tools that enable the first two things to be possible. So, I feel like I've gone from a girl in a bedroom, struggling and trying to learn to play guitar, to many, many thousands of people around the world who are working together on pure passion to transform the opportunities at the grassroots. I want to talk about a few examples of things that I've kind of encountered along the way. Um, examples of how different organizations, peoples, people and cities kind of can work together to transform their opportunities. First of all, I want to talk about my favorite city in the world, um, the city of Medellin in Colombia. Medellin is Colombia's second biggest city and has struggled in the past with situations of war and with massive drug cartels. 
Uh, Medellin was home to the infamous drug cartel leader Pablo Escobar, which some of you may have heard of. But this is a city that, through a process of working together, is transforming itself to a much better place. What they've done is the city have gone in and spoken to the communities directly, asking them what they want to transform their city. And the communities generally said connectivity. We need connectivity. And the, the city responded in a really innovative way. What they did is they installed the world's first public cable cars that connect the highest mountains with the city centre. They took the idea of an escalator, as you'd find in a shopping centre, and installed it onto the streets to help people get between their homes quicker. They have free Wi-Fi across the whole of the city, even on the highest mountains. Every child in the city gets a free laptop, and they have adverts on the TV that show you how to make a wireless booster out of a tin can. And they deliver the most incredible informal education through the most magnificent structures located in the poorest communities. Every time I go back to Medellin, I see it transform more and more and become a more equal place. So for me, Medellin is a real, real good example of an innovative city. The next example is an organisation very close to my heart. I have their logo tattooed on my arm. Um, this is Tuna El Fuerte, an organisation based in, El, in an area called El Val in Venezuela, in Caracas. This is a bunch of young people who realise the power of creativity in its ability to transform opportunities for the community. They went to Chavez and they asked him for a plot of land and told them about, his, about him about their idea. He gave them a disused car park in front of a military fort. And what they did was really innovative. They took 30 disused shipping containers and they converted them into different cultural spaces, creative spaces. Dance studios, theatre studios, recording studios and so on. Every single week, this space is accessed by over 500 young people. And it's an example of a community working together to transform itself through creativity and through creative opportunity. The next example is Uganda. Every year, we de deliver an event called Doa Doa in Uganda. When we first arrived in Uganda, we realised that the music infrastructure was really, really underdeveloped. And the other thing was that people tended to want to work on their own. So we went in and we promoted the idea of do it together, of people coming together for a collective benefit. But we also introduced a cooperative model, and we got people to sign up to this cooperative. And this year when I went to Uganda, I signed up for the cooperative, which now means that people in Uganda can develop their own music infrastructure. They can access finance, they can access equipment, access resources, in a way that they would never have been able to if they were acting alone. So again, this shows the tremendous power of Do It Together. Okay, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about today is an organization called Foro Doatio. Now, if some of you have seen the program, then you'd know that Felipe Altenfelder was supposed to be here today to talk to you about Foro Doatio, but he's not. So I'm going to explain the reason that he's not here, and then I'm going to do my best to explain the complex alternative economic, economic model that is Foro Doatio. Okay, so along with organizing the whole of the independent music infrastructure across Brazil, Foro Doatio have a very politicized kind of arm to what they do. In the recent revolutions that have been happening across Brazil, Foro Doatio decided to set up an alternative media channel called Media Ninja. This is citizen journalism and very much reporting around police brutality in the recent revolution. Because they did this and because it was so tremendously successful, the traditional media reacted and they formed a backlash against Foro Doatio. They've literally waged war on this organization. So every day this week, Foro Doatio has been headline news across Brazil. Felipe called me on Skype at like five in the morning saying, I can't come, but I want you to tell everybody why. And so Felipe is in Brazil at the moment fighting this battle with the traditional media because they want to represent what's happening on the ground. So, okay, Foro Doatio. This for me is the most impressive example of an organization of people working together in the whole of the world. Foro Doatio started in about 2003, when a bunch of students were a bit dissatisfied with what was happening culturally across Brazil. 
If you know the geography of Brazil, and it's a pretty big place, if you were a band in, about, in the year 2000, 2003, you would play in one of two places, in Rio or Sao Paulo. And they're both located, if this is Brazil, they're located on the bottom of Brazil. So the rest of, the Bra the rest of Brazil was left without any bands playing, without much cultural activity. These students were located in a place called Cuiabá, which is in the bottom of Brazil. And they decided they wanted to make more cultural activity happen in their city. So what they did is they started a recording studio and a rehearsal space in Cuiabá. What they realized when they started this, this space is that musicians generally don't have enough money to pay the full price for recording and so on. So what they did was really interesting. Rather than charging musicians the full price to use a recording studio, say it was $100, they charged them a reduced rate. But what they did was they wrote down the amount that the bands owed them. So they kept a logbook. So the bands would give them, say, $20, but they'd write down the 80 that was owed. Eventually, what they did is they had all of this money that was owed to them, and they needed in some ways for it to be paid back. So they asked the bands to do other things, not to pay them in cash, but to run a venue, or to become a sound engineer, or to use their skills to pay back and feed into the system. This happened, and this was really successful, and really kick-started the music infrastructure in Cuiabá. Then they realized, we actually need some actual money to come into this system. We need to pay for electricity, for lights, for water, and so on. So then they started putting on gigs and festivals where public audiences would pay into the system to come and attend cultural events. This was really successful, and things really started to take off in this place. But the next step, and really interestingly, was a restaurant wanted to get involved and sponsor all of these gigs that were happening. And rather than Foro do Oatio taking £10,000 £10, from the restaurant, they took half of the amount, but they said, all of our bands must eat at your restaurant for free. And so they started to generate this alternative economic model, and it, trans it transformed into a credit card system with currency on the cards. So this economic model was really successful. The music infrastructure was really, really successful there as well. And then what they did is they just got into cars and they drove to the next city, to the next city, to the next city, and so on. And they set up this infrastructure across Brazil. Today, Foro do Oatio operates over 200 cities in Brazil. It's run out of casas, out of houses, where people live, work, eat together. It's a very, very unusual and alternative setup. There's 2,000 people that work out of these 200 houses. Foro do Oatio mobilizes now 33,000 bands every year across Brazil, across these 200 cities, across 6,000 cultural events that they organize. And amazingly, astoundingly maybe, Foro do Oatio generate $44 million a year for the independent music infrastructure, all done on an entirely autonomous economic model. So for me, Foro do Oatio are an incredible example of what can happen when young people come together, work together, have a drive and a passion to set up something culturally, politically important in their country. And they can do it on this grand scale that generates so much income for the grassroots and independent music infrastructure. So, I come to the end of my presentation. I hope that I've explained to you how much the idea of Do It Together means to me. If you don't believe me, I have it tattooed on my back in Spanish. So I will just finish by saying thank you very much. Hagamos lo juntos. Thank you.